Praise the Lord. What do you say after that? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> um, first thing, I, I'd like to uh, uh, thank um, Andrew and Jamie for this opportunity, but also not just for me, but for all of this and uh, for the incredible The incredible blessing that Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries is, and this location and this building and everything. And Don and I had the, the privilege of coming to Karis while this facility was being built. And uh, I'll never forget that uh, what, when there were no seats or carpet or wood or anything in here, it was all just concrete, but you could see the stage. I went on a tour and I came through went over here in this area and it was all just metal uh, stuff. And I, I looked at, I could see the stage. And when I looked at the stage, I saw in my mind's eye, a bolt of lightning. And I thought, God, what's that? And he said, all eyes will be on this place. So I, I said, when we started this conference that God has an appointment with us today. How many of you believe that now? <clears throat> Thank you, Robert and Elizabeth, for that amazing performance. <clears throat> Elizabeth said before the show, she told me she hasn't slept in two weeks. <laughs> Wake up. No. <laughs> um, uh, fantastic. Just utterly amazing. The funny thing is that um, I got to set the, well, I was involved in setting the schedule for this um, conference. And um, so let me tell you a story. Last February, we were in Naples and uh, Brother E.W. Jackson uh, was there. And um, I got called up to the stage after E.W. And I said, when I'm setting the schedule for this, I'm not going after E.W. again. <laughs> I'm gonna go before. But now I have to go after that. <laughs> so how do you do that? Praise God. Um, also, I just want to give a quick shout out to everybody on the Truth and Liberty team, um, to my assistant, Robin Roth, uh, to Bryce Pico and Ryan Henley, who handle all of our social media and uh, blogs and all of that. Um, and. Uh, uh, just they do just su such an amazing job and I just want to say thank you how much I appreciate you um, um, there's been a message on my heart for several months uh, before I knew really anything about this show that you've just seen and this message I'm calling the Patriots price Andrew heard the Lord say that the third great awakening has begun, and I believe that. We are seeing some incredibly positive signs. People are waking up. Churches where pastors are taking a stand are the ones that are overflowing. Mario Marilla didn't talk about it, but he had a little event Last, I don't know when it started, but he called it a pastor's conference. It was supposed to be a luncheon. It turned into a month long event with hundreds and hundreds of people overflowing. He set up a tent and the, it was too small. There were people in the parking lot. And this is in Northern California. The United States Supreme Court just issued a, a decision. It wasn't a binding one, but it temporarily upheld the Texas heartbeat bill. The other day I was sitting in a conference room here at Karis interviewing a prospective student who God is delivering from transgenderism. And he told us about several accounts of people being set free. Andrew Womack Ministries is finishing its fiscal year and I understand that it's one of the best years ever for the ministry. So I'm telling you that God is doing great things and I do believe that the third great awakening has begun. But this morning I want to take the time that I have to talk about 
something that I have a conviction about as to what it is going to take to actually transform our nation. You see, I think everybody would agree by this time that America is in a crisis. According to the dictionary, a crisis is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger when difficult or important decisions must be made. The original meaning, however, is that crisis was a medical term and it meant the turning point of a disease. When an important change takes place, indicating either recovery or death, we are in a crisis. The President of the United States, so called, <laughs> just announced just announced that the government of the United States was going to compel its citizens to inject a vaccine into their bodies that is experimental, that according to a federal website has already resulted in over 100,000 injuries and 14,000 deaths. Crime is skyrocketing because people, cities have defunded the police. Massive riots, burning of buildings, churches shut down, our border overrun. And I don't need to go on. We are in a crisis. What is the cost of freedom? Freedom isn't free. We know this. We know this because of what we've been through as a nation. America has faced crises before. I want to take you back to December the 19th, 1776. America's war for independence was underway, had been underway since 1775. After conquered, and Lexington, the British began landing troops in Boston. The Continental Congress commissioned George Washington to be the commander in chief of the Continental Army. Volunteers began to pour out from all over the 13 colonies and they assembled at a place called Bunker Hill outside of Boston in a standoff against the British Army. The Americans were routed at Bunker Hill. After that, they stood against the British again at the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, and again they were routed. In a miraculous hand of God, they were, he enabled us to escape through the fog and the, and the mist to fight again. But then the British captured Fort Lee, and a, a great deal of America's munitions and cannons and rifles and supplies were confiscated. The Continental Army then fled and was chased across New Jersey over that ensuing fall of 1776. By the time they got to the Delaware River outside of Trenton, New Jersey, Washington's army was, had dwindled from about 24,000 men down to about 2,400 men. They crossed over the Delaware near a place called Harper's Ferry and they encamped there as winter set in. Hope for the cause of freedom began to wane. When the Declaration of Independence was signed, it said that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And when a government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish that government and to assume for themselves the state, the equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, and to form for themselves a government that is based on the consent of the governed. This idea is what was at stake, the hope of finally being, being able to establish a government that defends rights, does not abuse rights, that protects freedom, not enslaves. The hope of this cause, could it be, could it be that we could have a government like this? 
The hope for that was waning in America in December 1776. The commissions of the volunteers of the Continental Army were going to expire at New Year's. And most of the men were going to quit. They were going to return to their homes because they hadn't been paid. They didn't have much prospect of being paid. And they had lost every single battle they had been in up until that time. As they camped there in the winter, half of them, half of the 2400 was not ready for battle. George Washington knew that he was in a crisis and he knew that he had to make a decision. And on December the 19th, Thomas Paine issued a pamphlet that now has become famous and it was called The American Crisis. And in this pamphlet, Thomas Paine said these words, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to set a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should be, not be highly rated. Upon hearing and reading these words, George Washington resolved that he was going to have this pamphlet read to his army. He formed plans for a daring attack, a daring raid across the Delaware River into the Hessian forces at Trenton. It was, in the eyes of man and under natural thinking, a suicide mission. It was all or nothing. If the element of surprise was not maintained, Washington's forces would be wiped out. On December the 24th, Christmas Eve, he had the American crisis read to his troops. The troops rallied and they assembled and on Christmas Day, they crossed the Delaware on rented boats from up and down the Delaware River, Washington divided his small force into three bands. He had barely over a thousand men in his own group. The other, as they were preparing, a nor'easter rolled in. Temperatures plummeted. The Delaware began to freeze. Great chunks of ice were moving down the river. The men loaded the boats, with the, some with their horses and some with cannons, but not much. Two out of the three dispatchments didn't make it across. Washington's was the only one that made it across, and they were six hours late. By the time they got across the river, the sun was already rising. But they persevered, and along the way there was blood that could be seen in the snow because of the, the men's feet were bleeding. They didn't have proper clothes. They barely had any equipment at all, but they marched on. And when they got to Trenton about nine in the morning, the Hessians were still asleep because they'd been partying all day and all night. Praise be to God. <laughs> they caught them by surprise. <laughs> and by the time the Hessians knew what was up, they had taken the city. Amen. From there, from there, Washington's small band went on to fight again at Princeton, New Jersey, and won another surprise victory there. They reassembled and crossed back over the Delaware and regrouped, and word began to spread across America and even around the world. Volunteers began to pour out from the colonies again. Money began to flood in from foreign countries to help the American cause, and new birth and new life was breathed into the American cause, and this battle, the crossing of the Delaware, is known as the turning point of the American Revolution. Thomas Paine was right. Freedom is a celestial article. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of bondage. God is the author of freedom. 
Satan is the author of slavery. God established government to secure freedom, not to enslave. God made you and God made me in his own image and in his own likeness. And he wants us free so that we can fulfill his calling and his mission in our lives. When we talk about freedom and we talk about rights from the pulpit, we are not talking politics. We are preaching the gospel. Many today say that Christians have no business in politics. They say God's kingdom is internal and Jesus has a spiritual kingdom only. I just want to focus on the gospel. If I hear that again, I think I'm going to puke. It's true that Jesus' kingdom is internal. It's true that he sets us free on the inside. I will never forget that moment when I got born again and I was set free on the inside. I'll never forget it as long as I live and that is what I live for. Faith without works is dead. God doesn't want us just free on the inside. He wants us free in our entire life. Don't be deceived, church. Spiritual freedom is only the beginning. One of the biggest problems in, our, in the church today, in my opinion, is that many people think, many people think that revival is just a good meeting. I got goosebumps at that meeting. I got excited at that meeting. Praise and worship was awesome at that meeting. But I want to tell you something, guys. It's not revival unless change takes place in that meeting and the church goes out and changes the culture, changes the world. It's like a guy who goes, it's like a guy who, you know, is smoke, he's a smoker and he's got high blood pressure and one day, you know, he overeats, he sits on the couch, he doesn't exercise. And one day he has a heart attack. Doctor says to him, listen guy, I'm going to give you prescriptions for some high blood pressure medicine, okay? But you got to start exercising and you got to eat right and you got to lose that weight. And this guy goes home and he starts taking his high blood pressure medication and his blood pressure comes down and he feels better. But what does he do? He keeps eating the donuts and the Twinkies and drinking the Cokes and sitting on his couch and not exercising. And then one day that heart attack comes back and boom, he's gone. Because all he did was the easy part, he didn't do the hard part. If all we do is go to church meetings and feel good and get goosebumps, and we don't do the hard part of going out and working and fighting to change the culture and change the world, then we're no different than that man. If you believe in truth, how many here believe in truth? Do you believe that truth sets you free? Yes. Do you believe truth will set other people free? Yes. If you believe that, then you cannot. Sorry guys, I'm getting worked up. You cannot, you cannot stop short and say, I'm not supposed to take truth there. I'm only supposed to keep truth here. Whoever baked a cake and said the, the leaven only stays in this part of the cake. The world is God's cake and you're his leaven. God wants us out there. He wants us making a difference. He wants us working and changing the world. Imagine if our forefathers had had that mindset. Imagine if they thought, oh, I can't preach politics from the pulpit. I can't bring God into government. We'd still be an English colony. There never would have been anyone to end slavery. We'd still have slavery today. Who would have stopped the Nazis? Who would have stopped communism? Nobody. But thank God our father, our forefathers didn't think that way. 
Thank God they knew that freedom has a price and that they were willing to pay that price. The Battle Hymn of the Republic says, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. The Patriot's Price. Past generations in America have been willing to pay the price. Thomas Paine said that heaven knows how to set a price upon its goods. When the pilgrims landed at Cape Cod, Massachusetts in 1620, they had 102 souls. Imagine sailing across the world into an uncharted wilderness with 102 people on what by today's standards would be a tiny little boat. What I want to point out today is that they landed in November and by March over half of them were dead. The captain of the Mayflower pleaded with them to go back to England with him, and they declined. You see, they came here to start a new society, a Christian society, and they were willing to pay the price. In the Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers wrote this, in support of this declaration and with firm reliance, Upon the protections of divine providence, we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. During the uh, convention or the, the assembly when they were voting on the declaration, one of the delegates said, he said, if we vote on this, he, he, said, he said, we better hang together, guys, Benjamin Franklin responded back to him, that's true because uh, if we don't hang together, we'll certainly hang separately. <laughs> Nine of the 56, 56 uh, signers of the Declaration fought and died from wounds or hardships during the Revolutionary War. Five of them were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost sons in the Revolutionary Army. Just thinking about that one and thinking... Dear God, if today someone told me, Richard, if you keep fighting, your son is going to die, could I make that decision? Could I say, all right, I'm still in the fight? I'm asking God for the grace. The Civil War. It's time as a country that we put racism behind us. There's no more, no more place for it. I'm done with it. <laughs> but please don't tell me this is a systemically racist country. Learn your history. Stop listening to the liars. Over 400,000 Union soldiers died in the, re in, the war, in the Civil War to end slavery. Talk about sacrifice. 40% of the remains were never identified. One fifth of all soldiers in that war died. Two and a half percent of the entire American population. That is the equivalent. If we were in a similar conflict today, it would mean that seven million Americans would die. Can you fathom that level of sacrifice? World War I, 117,000 Americans died, 200,000 were wounded. World War II, 418,000 dead, 670,000 wounded. In Korea, 36,500 dead, 103,000 wounded. Vietnam, 47,000 dead, 103,000 wounded. And then you have the War on Terror. You can see the numbers. Past generations have paid the price. The question that remains for us is, will we pay the price? Are we willing to pay whatever it takes? Patrick Henry said in his famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. He's saying, I don't want to live as a slave. 
If I have to live as a slave, I'd rather die. I would rather die in the fight for liberty than live as a slave. Today, there aren't many bullets flying in America yet. I pray to God there never are. But we are no less in a war. We are in a war. It is a war of ideas and principles. And every one of you is holding in your wallet right now a spiritual draft card. The commander in chief has drafted you into this war. Just like those heroes on 9-11, every one of us is faced right now with the decision. What will I do in this crisis? You know, as a country, we still face external enemies. Afghanistan, the debacle of what just happened in Afghanistan, that's a too soft of a word. The utter tragedy of it shows us that. But unlike the conflicts of, a pa of the past, the greatest threat to freedom in America today is internal, not external. The United States military requires an oath for its enlisted and its officers, and that oath, in that oath, the man has to say that he swears to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The threats inside of our country today could not even have been imagined 20 years ago. That is for us who were actually going about life and raising families and building businesses and leading ministries and everything else that's good and wholesome. I do believe that the wicked were plotting 20 years ago and, and even beyond. But for most of us, the things that we're seeing now were unimaginable. Mandatory vaccines, churches being shut down, businesses being shut down over a virus that has a 99% survival rate? There's something else afoot here. A woke culture that bans free speech, deplatforms the President of the United States. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Government agencies being corrupted, weaponized, politicized, gun confiscation. The abrogation of parental rights, how dare you tell me that I cannot be informed when my child goes to a doctor and wants to have an abortion? How dare you tell me that I cannot get my child who might be struggling with same-sex attraction help with a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or some kind of spiritual counselor? Who do you think you are? These are fundamental rights. And this is just what's already happened in America. Here's my question for you today. What else is going to happen if we don't stand up? What will our nation, what will our world be like if we don't fight back and win? Many people would say, oh, Richard, the price is too high. I'm going to miss the football game. People will criticize me on social media. I'll be unfriended. Well, I say the price is too high not to take a stand. Again, don't be deceived, church. We really don't have a choice when you think about it. We will pay a price. The only question is, are we gonna pay it now or are we gonna pay it later? We can either pay the price now of perseverance, hard work, personal sacrifice to stand up and fight in our culture and reestablish freedom and the founding principles of this nation. We can pay that price now 
or we can pay the price later for having failed to do so. As for me, I want to pay it now so my family doesn't have to pay it later. Ronald Reagan, love Ronald Reagan. We named uh, our middle son after him. He said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States where men were free. I never knew that Ronald Reagan had a gift of prophecy. We're not quite there yet, but we're close, aren't we? So brothers and sisters, don't, please, and everybody listening online, please, do not think that someone else is going to do it. Do not think that someone else is going to take care of this. There is no one else. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us working and sacrificing and getting involved and speaking up and taking a stand and paying the price. I'd like to close this by going to the book of Nehemiah in the Bible. If you've got your Bibles with you, please turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. So Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king in Persia. Judah had been in captivity in, in Babylon and then in Persia for 70 years now. Nehemiah, of course, was Jewish. And there were people that came to the Persian king who had been in Jerusalem. And it, it says in verse 3 that they spoke to him and they said, and they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province, means in Judah, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. On hearing these words, Nehemiah was moved deeply for his brothers and sisters that were under affliction, for the broken down walls of the holy city, Jerusalem. He was moved to action. He believed that there was a cause that was worthy of his life, even though it was greater than he could do on his own. And you know the story, how he went to the king and the king gave him permission to take Jews from Persia back to Israel to rebuild the wall. When he got there, he faced great opposition and threats. There were two guys that the book of Nehemiah talks about named Sanballat and Tobiah. I want you to turn over to chapter 4 now. And I want to read chapter 4 at length. Will you bear with me if we read a few scriptures this morning? I'm only supposed to read one, at a, one verse at a time, I'm told, but I can't help it. You, you need the context here. You need to see the story. Let's start reading in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Guys in the booth, if you can just track along with the verses up there. It came to pass that when, Sen when Pelosi... <laughs> ...heard that we builded the wall, she was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Christians... I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and she spake before his, uh, her brethren and the army of Samaria. What? The, she spoke, spoke before the Democrats? <laughs> and, and said, what do these feeble Christians, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Schumer the Ammonite <laughs> was next to her and he said, even that which they build, a little fox will go up and break it down their stone wall. 
Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Do we have a mind to work in America today? But it came to pass that when Pelosi and Schumer and the LGBT and the abortionists and the BLM Antifa heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, hallelujah, the third great awakening is beginning. Then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Pause. Did you hear that? We prayed unto our God and we got to work. You, I'm all for prayer meetings. But prayer meetings are not going to get the job done if we don't get to work. And Judah said, well, I'm going to skip down actually. Let's skip down to verse 13. Therefore said I, in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, and fight for your wives and your houses. Church, it's time, it's time. There is no more time. We are out of time. We must stand up now and we must fight. We must rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We must rebuild the United States of America, this constitutional republic under God. The time is now, we cannot wait any longer. And it came to pass. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us how God had brought their counsel to naught, hallelujah, that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of the servants wrought, it wrought in the work and the other half of them held the spears, the shields and the bows and the habergions. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah, they which builded on the wall and they that bear the burdens with those that laid it, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon for the builders everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded and he that sounded the trumpet was with me and I could go on but we are called today church we are called to stand up we're called to fight with one hand and build with the other and we're called to take our position on the wall Today, our wall has been broken down. We have been overrun and occupied by the enemies of God. Our freedom, I love what Andrew said. This little place right here is a little enclave of freedom. It's kind of like Washington on the other side of the Delaware right here. And God is calling us to rise up and go out against all odds. And he'll be with us and he will help us. Our freedom, this is true, this is a true statement. Our freedom, our families, and our faith are at stake. Will you work? Will you fight? Will you pay the price? The Patriots price? The third great awakening has begun. God is doing amazing things. 
But will you do your part? I got a word for you today. You are essential. You are necessary. And you are able. So what part of the wall has the Lord assigned you to? If you don't have the answer to that one, get it answered. What part of the wall has the Lord assigned you to? Well, get there and get to work. It was said just in part of the drama that we saw earlier, the young man named Danny, I think it was Mike that said this, but he said, his choice was not made on 9-11, but long before. Today, as we go forth out of this conference, we're going forth into battle, aren't we? We're going forth to rebuild the wall. But if we think, like Elizabeth said, if we think that we're going to make our choice after the tribulation is upon us, that's not going to happen. Now is the time. Now is the time to make your choice. Make your choice today. If you are willing to pay the Patriots price, I would like to see you stand up. And if you're not willing, don't stand up. God knows. And I believe, I believe with all my heart that there are millions of us out there that are willing to pay the price. We are not alone. And God is with us. And God's promises, God's promises of victory are still alive today. They're still ours. Amen, church? So let me just close this with a prayer and then we'll be on a break, okay? Pray with me. Close your eyes, bow your heads. Dear Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much, God. I thank you so much, Lord, for who you are, for your word, God, that never changes. That's always true. Thank you, Father, that you promise us that you will always cause us to triumph. And Father, we call out to you today. We lay our hearts before you today. Father, and we say, God, we are willing to pay the price. Like the Apostle Paul, we die daily, Father. We are willing to be poured out as a drink offering, Lord. Use us, God. Use us to change America. Use us to reestablish truth in this nation. Use us, Father, in the third great awakening. Father, no matter the cost and no matter the price, we will obey you. Give us the wisdom to know your calling. Give us the discernment to be effective. And give us the boldness, God, to stand in the face of the adversary. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Praise God. Glory, God is good. Wish I had that big flag, I'd start waving it here. Love you guys. Listen, we are now on a break. It, uh, please come back at uh, 10 minutes after 10 because you are in for a huge treat as Bishop E.W. Jackson is up next. Enjoy our booths, our cafes, and uh, all the uh, exhibitors out there.